So our next speaker is Jeff Nevin. Jeff, please come to the podium, uh, is a co-founder of Boundary Stone Partners and Director of External Affairs for TerraPower, an exciting nuclear company famously backed by Bill Gates. Uh, over the last decade, Jeff has worked as a facilitator and mediator between companies, investors, trade associations and NGOs to bring decarbonized solutions, including nuclear, uh, onto the market and into electricity uh, grid. Prior to this, Jeff served as a Chief of Staff at the Department of Energy uh, under President Barack Obama. Please welcome Jeff. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me. It's it's, it's great to be here. Um, I'm, uh, um, I'm excited to talk a little bit about how we in the United States got to this point where uh, both Democrats and Republicans uh, sort of agree that nuclear needs to be part of our, our national energy strategy. If you've been following the news, you might notice that this appears to be the only thing that both parties <laughs> agree on uh, in the United States. But it wasn't always this way, and I want to talk a little bit about, um, about how we got here. So um, Boundary Stone Partners is the firm that I work at. Um, we've been around for 10 years. We work in just about every aspect of clean energy that you can think of. But before uh, I founded the firm, uh, I spent about 15 years in government. Um, and I worked um, under uh, uh, two energy secretaries, uh, Stephen Chu uh, and Ernie Moniz, both of which are, were pretty uh, uh, esteemed physicists and, and really shaped a lot of my thinking um, on these issues. Uh, uh, Dr. Chu won the Nobel Prize in physics. Um, uh, Dr. Moniz ran the uh, MIT Energy Initiative um, as well. So I want to talk. Uh, so so when I when I when I came out of government, I got a phone call from a friend of mine, uh, and they, this film Pandora's Promise had just come out, and it was a film about. Uh, environmentalists who changed their positions on nuclear power. And he called me and said, we want to come to Washington, D.C. We want to talk about nuclear. We, we think there's an opportunity to move the opposition, which was largely on the political left. And I said, sure, but I think we've kind of solved that. I mean, I've just spent the last four years with these two physicists. Anytime I tried to raise a concern about nuclear, they swatted me down pretty quickly to talk about how um, any concerns that I had about nuclear were swamped by the potential that it could do to solve the climate crisis. Um, they said, well, that's not really what we're seeing here in California, so uh, maybe we need to do a little bit more work. So brought them out, started working with them. And a pretty amazing thing happened. We did briefings on the Hill. We went to the White House. We had conversations, and we found a lot of interest we found Republican offices who, at that time, were not even willing to admit that climate change was a problem, enthusiastically supporting nuclear. And we saw Democrats who um, traditionally had been pretty opposed to nuclear showing up wanting to learn more about the role that nuclear could solve. What we found was there were a lot of traditional environmental groups, however, who just weren't there. Right? They had been founded in the 60s or 70s or in the came of age in the 80s when protesting nuclear power plants was something that you had to do in order to show your environmental credentials. Um, uh, younger people in those organizations, very open, but some of the, more, the donors, the founders, the people running those organizations weren't quite there. So we found some groups, some very well-established environmental groups that were open to this conversation. Uh, Third Way, the Bipartisan Policy Center, Clean Air Task Force, um, and some others, and we put together a group that took about a year through the Bipartisan Policy Center. Chatham House rules. Um, everybody was kind of there to sort of put their case out. And we focused on energy systems modeling. And I know the next uh, presenter is going to talk a little bit about that. And we asked this question, can you get to net zero without nuclear? Show us your models. And they started showing up. And what we started to see was a lot of people would say, look, my organization's not really comfortable with nuclear, but we just can't get there without something that's firm, flexible, and zero carbon. And we let everybody have this conversation behind closed doors, right? And we met people where they were, and we said, look, we understand you know, that your organization has traditionally had this position. And we let them kind of work out with each other, well, how do we want to kind of go about this question? How do we? We want to be sort of intellectually honest. We've been telling voters, we've been telling politicians they need to trust the science when it comes to climate change. So we're not really comfortable saying, but we're not going to trust the energy systems models. Well, you know, we're just going to kind of, kind of make up what the solution can be. But we really gave them space to come to the conclusions in the places where, that they were um, at their own time. 
And, and um, a couple of things happened through this process, right? Um, the, these, this was all sort of happening in the 2014, 2015, 2016, sort of started there. But in 2018, two big, two big things happened that really changed the debate in the United States. The first was a groundbreaking report by the UN IPCC on uh, what it would take to mitigate global warming, to keep global warming below 1.5 degrees C. The UN um, IPCC obviously very well globally respected in the climate community. And in this report, uh, they talked in the first half, um, the Old Testament part, about all of the terrible things that were going to happen if we let climate go beyond 1.5. And then in the New Testament part, they talked about what it's going to take to get there. And in their report, they talked about a 2x to 3x expansion of nuclear power globally necessary to meet the challenges of climate change. And that was a very seminal moment for these internal conversations we were having with a lot of the environmental groups. They trusted the UN, they trusted the IPCC, and they recognized that they might need to shift their thinking a bit if they were going to actually um, meet uh, uh, um, this piece. The second thing that followed that um, was this report called The Nuclear Power Dilemma by the Union of Concerned Scientists. The Union of Concerned Scientists, very well respected group in the United States, actually founded as a nonproliferation group. So, so they started as a group of scientists talking about the need to limit nuclear weapons and the threat of nuclear weapons, grew into environmental concerns, had been if not anti, the most skeptical of the environmental groups on nuclear power. They reached the conclusion that we could not solve the decarbonization challenge in the United States without protecting the existing fleet of nuclear reactors that we had. And they put this paper out. Now, normally white papers, you know, um, um, don't sort of, you know, send shockwaves, but this one did send shockwaves through the environmental community. Shortly thereafter, World Resources International uh, put out a statement saying that they too were shifting their position on nuclear and that we needed to consider nuclear power as a decarbonization um, solution. So that then led us to um, a set of conversations that um, started with policymakers, and we were really at this time focusing on the de on the Democratic left, right? So. Um, Republicans had, and, and the reason we were focusing there is because Republicans were very supportive of nuclear. Like, they, there was a core part of their energy policy. We didn't feel like there was a lot of uh, inroads that we needed to make. We obviously had some real support at the U.S. Department of Energy, at that time being led by Dr. Um, Ernie Moniz. And we also started to get very strong support from the labor movement, right? And this is something that I think was a bit underappreciated at the time in the U.S. So environmentalists are certainly influential within democratic politics, but organized labor is far more influential um, uh, to elected officials in the democratic side. And what labor recognized was a few things. One, the democratic policies on decarbonization were hitting coal communities particularly hard and coal workers very, very hard. Coal plants were being shut down, coal mines were being shut down. These were very highly unionized subsectors. They were being replaced largely with renewable energy. Renewable energy construction was not highly unionized, and the uh, number of people needed to operate a working solar or wind farm are, are quite small. They were losing membership, and they were losing jobs for their members. Nuclear, highly unionized in terms of operations. Um, you need a very highly skilled workforce, as was just mentioned, to, to operate a nuclear power plant. But same with construction. Right. So they saw the opportunities to build new nuclear plants, to continue the operation of nuclear plants as something that was important for their workforce. That was a huge constituency um, for us um, um, as well. So, so a couple of things um, um, started to happen. The Obama administration was quietly doing quite a bit for nuclear, and we wanted to sort of elevate some of those, some of those things so that other Democrats could see what was happening first. Uh, in 2014, the administration announced a $12 billion loan guarantee to the Vogel uh, plant in Georgia. Um, uh, later that, uh, the next year in 2015, the White House held the first ever White House Summit on Advanced Nuclear, which was kind of the first time that there was a high level federal discussion about the importance of Generation 4 technologies. Uh, it stood up the GAIN program and stood up a couple of other initiatives to start supporting entrepreneurs who were building those uh, reactors. Um, 
in 2016 a piece of legislation to make it easier to license and to build advanced nuclear reactors um, uh, passed the Senate, and it actually passed the Senate 87 to 4, right? So the first vote that we had on anything in the U.S. Senate on advanced nuclear passed 87 to 4, and that, that got a lot of, lot of attention. So then moving forward, um, oops, back. So moving forward, um, nuclear was a key part of the Bipartisan Energy Act of 2020. So at this point now, uh, we have the Trump administration in office and in power, um, same level of support. Um, uh, out of that came uh, the uh, uh, Nuclear Energy Leadership Act, which resulted in the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program, which Assistant Secretary Barronwall uh, administered when she was at uh, uh, the, uh, the Department of Energy. Um, that set up a $4 billion program to demonstrate first-of-a-kind advanced uh, nuclear reactor projects. Um, and, um, and then the two signature pieces of the Biden administration, the infrastructure, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill and the Inflation Reduction Act, both also contained huge support for nuclear power. Right? In the infrastructure bill, we got additional funding for the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program. We also got $6 billion in credits to keep the existing fleet of the United States operating, to ensure that if those reactors ran into financial headwinds, that there was federal money to support their continued operation so that they could continue to produce zero carbon, 24-7 power. In the Inflation Reduction Act, um, we achieved something that had been a long time priority for the uh, nuclear community, which was parity for tax credits with renewable energy. So going forward, electricity generated by nuclear power receives the same tax benefits as um, uh, electricity produced from wind and solar and geothermal and other forms of zero carbon technology. So um, as part of that, we've also seen uh, public opinion rise as well. So this is a fairly recent um, report that uh, the Pew Research Center uh, pointed out that saw from 2016 to 2023, we've seen pretty, um, pretty significant increases across the board, Democrats, Republicans, uh, across the board in support for nuclear power. Now, I think um, a lot of this has to do with the fact that we moved elite opinion first. We had people out there with voices that were credible. One of the things we've seen with public opinion when it comes to nuclear, in the United States at least, is it's very malleable, right? So people would have opinions, but you could give them just a little bit of information that was either positive or negative, and it would move those opinions. People don't, I, I know this breaks my heart, but people don't spend a lot of time thinking about nuclear power. And, um, um, uh, uh, but having credible voices that can sort of influence that thinking makes a big difference. That's a, that's a huge opportunity for us. It's also a threat, right? So um, one of the criticisms I think that we have looking back is you know, after Three Mile Island in the United States, we had all these great nuclear power plants running, but we didn't talk about them. We just kind of like hoped people wouldn't notice that we were producing power with nuclear, so people weren't seeing those benefits. So now that we were sort of changing that, 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 that position and getting out there and talking about the benefits that nuclear can provide, we really started to see kind of an uptick um, um, in, in public opinion. So, you know, we've started to see in the last few years um, uh, states uh, making big shifts to support nuclear power, including states that, uh, you know, uh, very democratic, New York, Illinois, and most notably California, which had passed a, a, a phase out of their nuclear power plants, stopped, lifted that, and is now working to keep their remaining uh, nuclear plant at Diablo Canyon um, up, up and running. Um, and, um, and internationally, we're seeing a lot of uh, a growing support as well, particularly after the invasion of Ukraine, Central and Eastern Europe are looking for those energy security um, uh, opportunities to get off of Russian gas, and some of these new advanced nuclear technologies um, uh, provide that opportunity um, um, for them. So um, I don't pretend to want to tell Australia how to do its politics, its policies, or, or the like. I'm hoping some of these things can help give you a little bit of insight as to what we found that was useful in the United States. But um, I do see some corollaries and some threads and some things that, um, that might be useful to think about. First, as we talked about, getting, rooting the case for nuclear in the 
energy system modeling, I think, was really important to move some environmental concern. We made opposition to nuclear or, or support for nuclear be something that you can do and be completely consistent with holding strong environmental values and trying to uh, solve the decarbonization and climate solution. Secondly, we really saw uh, things start to shift when we engaged the labor movement and, we, and, and the labor community started to see this as an opportunity to protect good paying jobs and nuclear globally pays more than any other subsector of, of energy, right? When we build these plants, you're talking 60 to 80 years of high paying jobs in a local community. Nobody else can make that, that, that claim. Um, and then the second piece is um, in, in sort of you know, I know we'll talk a lot about uh, the, the, the maritime program and the, the nuclear navy program. In the United States, one of our biggest proponents of continuing to push for a strong civil nuclear program is the U.S. Navy. Why? Because they work very hard to recruit the best and brightest young sailors to go into the nuclear program. Operating a nuclear submarine or nuclear aircraft carrier is a very intense and very important job, and you want your best Naval Academy students going into that program. And the case that they make is, once you graduate, once you do your service, and you go in back into the civilian life, you will have an opportunity to work at a nuclear power plant or in the nuclear industry and have a robust, long, lifetime career. I don't know how you make that case to young sailors in a country where their opportunities aren't the same as, as we have. So. Um, um, as you're thinking about standing up that program, you know, and I know the previous speaker just talked about the importance of workforce, one thing to think about is how are we making the case to ensure that the best and brightest sailors in our Navy choose the nuclear uh, portion and what are we promising to them afterwards? The worst thing that could happen is you take your best and brightest, you give them all these skills, they get out of the Navy and then they have to leave the country in order to uh, uh, continue, continue their careers. So just um, um, something to think about. So um, I'm happy to, uh, to answer any questions. Um, hopefully I stirred the harness dust a little bit. <laughs>